Well, welcome back to another episode of the Cost of Doing Business show. This time, we are not in my own studio. We are in Manny's The Construction Life podcast. I'm the little dog here. Manny's the big dog. Uh, but yeah, Manny, give us a bit of a, give our audience a bit of an idea of uh, who you are and what Construction Life podcast is. I actually, I was funny this morning, I was looking at the schedule and I, I came across one of the very first photos that I took about the first show that I ever did on a job site. And it actually works out in March, works out to be six years that I've been doing this show, that I've been recording this show. Obviously, the first couple of years, it was like whenever I could, whenever I could fit it in. Yeah. And then the last two years is kind of ramped up where I've actually focused a lot and and just basically crossed so many uh, shows out there. And uh, I've been doing this for that six year period. And I've been interviewing 500 plus contractors and people that are in the industry and people that are outside of the industry but contributing to the industry and uh i thoroughly enjoy having these conversations just talking to people meeting people whether we're doing a zoom show from halfway around the world yeah. or or having guests like yourself travel here we've had lots of people travel here travel from across the country from the states coming up here they like coming into the studio the studio is great uh like i said i think it was it's so coming up on two years that we decided to go the studio route and do the video. Yeah, it's shows, awesome, right? This is exactly what it's I want to great. Do. I know you showed me your yeah. travel kit, and yeah. I had the exact same kit, and I was just like, ah, I did that years. I did it for three years. I did it. Like you bring it in, you set it up, and it takes you 10, 15 minutes yep. to set it up. Yep. And then you test it, and then all of a sudden you start talking. We used to do it on the site. Yeah. We used to at the end of the workday, we would just schedule it. We would plan it and uh, call somebody, DM somebody, and just go, hey, you want to be on the show? You want to be on the show? Come here. Come to this job site. We set it up. I actually built a lunch table that had the holes in it so we could put the mics in it, right? <laughs> and it was all set up for it, so it was designed perfectly for it. And then I think we, I just evolved. I just wanted to evolve, and I like having the conversations. I like learning uh, from other people, and I've always joked on my show and, and even talking to people through uh, networking, I wish I had this 15 yeah. years ago when I got started, yeah. right? It would have helped me a lot considerably right uh because the information is out there but nobody really knows what to ask or where to ask that's the problem that i i learned in the beginning right and i used to just i got all of my information going to trade shows and i started yeah. with the canadian shows then i went to the american shows um obviously right now ibs and KBIS is going on right now right in vegas uh they're doing it for the next two days well, one more day i think it's tomorrow's last day um i've been to that show nine times wow. and i did it because i just wanted to educate myself Right. And it was great to build a network. And in the beginning, it would be on my own dime. I would travel to Atlanta, to New Orleans, to Chicago, to Vegas, to Florida, um, because I was hungry for the knowledge about how to build better and how to use certain things in the industry to my advantage. Yeah. Right. And that's how I built my business. I was always inquiring about things so what, what what was your background with your business give us a rundown of how you got i was started. a gc so i was a gc i got started i i was never um i didn't fall into it my dad was a mason but i didn't fall into construction that wasn't my choice when i was in high school and as a teenager you're like okay what am i going to do in my life kind of thing right um i was already all set to be a draftsman I was going down the path of being an architect. I was going to go do all that stuff. My older brother was already in that world and he was working for a firm and he was basically a drafts person who was doing a lot of mock-ups and drawings for people, cleaning up the stuff for architects, you know, and the architect would take the credit, put stamp on and move on. And that's the project. Um, so I, I thought that was kind of fascinating because I would see him show me some blueprints, show me some drawings. And I'm like, okay, I kind of like that. And then that mixed in with my dad being a Mason and, and I put the two worlds together and I'm in high school and all of a sudden I'm like thinking, okay, that's where I'm going to go. But towards my last year of schooling uh, in high school, I got the film bug and then I was interested in filmmaking and storytelling. And then I went to film school instead. I chose that instead. Hated it. I hated <laughs> it, man. Like I didn't, I honestly felt like a serious fish out of water. I didn't, I wasn't them. I wasn't that person. I don't know if it was because the construction was still resident, like on me or something like that, but I, I hated it and I actually quit. I quit, just started working and I was working odd jobs. I did landscaping, I did hardscaping, I did mural painting, I did whatever I wanted to do and, and I did that for a couple of years and then I went back to film school, to a different film school and it was right. I think I needed to grow up. Mm. I'm in my late teens, I'm in my early 20s and I think I needed to grow up a bit. 
And so I wasn't ready for storytelling just yet. Uh, and then that's why I think that little break there of just having odd jobs here and there and just meeting different people kind of just got me going. Kind of set yourself. Yeah. Yeah. yeah kind of level yeah. set. Yeah. And then I went back, loved it, did it, enjoyed it, um, got what I needed to get out of it. Um, I was always a quiet kid um, in school. I was never front of the class kid. Um, but in, in film school, I was front of the class kid. I was hand up asking questions. I was curious. I was learning. I was being told, check this out, learn this, understand this. Like I was really fascinated by the theory behind storytelling, like all that. I was just fascinated by that stuff. Right. But in the same time, I was going to study film and I was going to see films as well too. Mm -hmm. Right. So I just immersed myself in that whole world and I did that. And then I was fortunate enough to get an agent and I started directing commercials. And then from directing commercials, I did that for a few years. And then the recession hit. Like you guys know about it in 2009. Everything shut down. Everything was like slowing down. And iPhone was introduced. And everybody could be a filmmaker now with the iPhone in 09, right? So 09, that, that 08, 09, 2010, that changed digitally. That was the beginning of what we are so used to now mm. regarding our heads down um, and looking at devices, right? And so, um, I mean, I couldn't get much work. It was a different landscape at that point. And then all of a sudden, I guess just by fate, I bumped into a high school friend and he was on a path of going to architect. He was in my same drafting classes all through high school. Um, and then he just, he went that route. And then I bump into him years later, I finished film and I'm in film. And uh, I asked him, how did it all go? And he goes, I hated it. I left it and I became a GC. And so him and I got started working together as GCs. And then we had ideas and I was in the GC world doing construction, doing jobs. And at the same time, I'm going to IBS, I'm going to KBIS and I'm learning construction. I want to figure out new products and new techniques. And I was always questioning. Um, and sure enough, we started creating some content and then the producers came along and they started asking us, do you want to do a show? Do you want to do a show and all this other stuff? And, and I kept on butting heads with them because um, uh, I wanted to do a construction show. I wanted to talk about construction. I wanted to learn about construction. What I wanted, did they want to talk about? They wanted to talk about fluff. They wanted to just like <laughs> interior designing and <laughs> Pinterest this and house that. Yeah. And, and I was like, I'm not interested in any of that. Like I really connected as because of the success of this show with the tradesperson, with mm. the contractor. I really respect blue collar boots on the ground and the hard work that they put in. And so I wanted to show that they didn't want to show that. So I would just say no. And then they would look at you as if you just ran over their puppy. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> why are you saying no to a TV opportunity? I was going, I didn't want to do that. I'm not interested in that. It wasn't, um, it was a double-edged sword when, when they got wind that I had a film background, that I studied film, right? They didn't want that. They wanted someone that they can basically just dictate. Just tell what to do. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And, and you, I'm like, so this, yeah, you had your own opinion as yeah. to what for storyline. Yeah, exactly. I Because I, I had that, like, what's, I had that opinion because I didn't see it yet. doesn't matter what channel it was or what broadcast or what opportunity. And we're talking, this is like the beginning of the internet, beginning of social media, right? This is pre-IG, you know what I mean? Like, I didn't see it yet. Like, I just, and I wanted to see it. So I, I was, I tried, I tried. And, and it, was a, it was a running joke on the job site every time. I would always get an email from some producer that just found me, found my content, was very interested because I was opinionated, right? So it's like, they, someone meets you, Tells you they love you. They love what you're sharing, how you are, your character, your personality. And, and in, you got to go back like in film school. I hated the performance classes. I hated the uh, acting classes because I hated being in front of the camera, right? I, I couldn't stand it because you were always trying to be a different person than who you really yeah, were. Right. But in construction, and when I talk on the construction life, this is me. Yeah. So I'm not performing. I'm not trying to be um, a character. Yeah. This is who I am. Yeah. You either like me or you don't like me, You're right? Yeah. So then I didn't like them asking me to do that. And I would always say, listen, guys, don't ask me to change. Like, this is who you, I am. This is what I'm going to do. Don't, don't try to, oh, no, no. There'd be lots of conversations about you need to go to host school. And I was like, what is that? Like performance school. I was like, what is that? Well, we need to teach you how to walk and how to talk and where to put your hands and how to look exactly all these things that I don't agree with. I'm like, if you like the character that you've met, the personality, why that are you trying to change? Why it? are you trying to change? It? <laughs> right. So I never would agree. And it, it got to the point where I didn't care. I was in so many meetings where it got to the point where I would just make up stuff. 
just to annoy them <laughs> because I knew I wasn't going to agree with them and we were never going to go further with it, right? So I would just say, you know, why don't we do this for a show? They're like, why would you want to do that? I don't understand. Like, I had show ideas where I was pitching the idea where I was, I, I still am big in film. I still talk to a lot of people in film and TV and I still talk to a lot of post people and we're always trying different ideas and things like that. You're always creative. You're creative, you're creative. Like, mm -hmm. you always kind of drum up ideas. So I would always tell them, I'd love to see a construction show where you do a reveal, it's beautiful, and then all of a sudden, like, a bunch of gorillas come in and just smash the place apart. And the producers were looking at me going, why would you want to do that? I was going, because people would want to see that. They're like, nobody wants to see that. I go, I want to see a bunch of gorillas destroy a kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, no, this is not going to work. Can you please leave? And I'm like, sure, see you later. And that was it. So it, it eventually. Did you ever do it? No, I never. <laughs> you know what's funny, Joe Weston? I storyboarded it. I totally storyboarded it. I, I've got storyboards, old storyboards of gorillas um, bathing in bathtubs, showering. Because I had this crazy idea about gorillas, right? I was just like, I like to see really wild animals in residential environments. <laughs> like just like rhino smashing through and stuff like that. And then, you know, I, I said to them, guys, just imagine if people watch this and they were like, did Manny really do that? Like, did they destroy that kitchen? Like, is that what he really wanted to do? I go, I'm never going to tell you. But they didn't go for it. They didn't like it. So we just, we parted ways. And that's how this show was born. Like I, I, I said. So this is the authentic Manny. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I said, you know what? I think I can have a conversation with somebody about construction. I, I know enough to carry any trade. I don't mm -hmm. know enough to do that trade, but I know enough to carry the conversation with mm -hmm. that trade, right? Mm -hmm. And like, you know, because you, you got your business and you, you're talking to so many contractors as well. They all have a common theme. Like everybody has the same problems. Everybody's trying to solve the same problems. Everybody's trying to be better. They always want to build their business, their brand. They always want to grow. They want to bring more people. Like they're, they're, that's always there. And everyone's always trying to figure out what's the best way to do that. How do we do that? And I don't think it's like there's best ways or how do we do it. There's no secret sauce or anything like that. It's just work. You just work at it. Simple as that. That's what I've learned from either young, old doesn't matter. I've interviewed people as young as 15, as old as 70, 75, 76. Wow. They all have the same problems in construction. They're all trying to figure it out. Whether the younger generation today is figuring it out faster because they've got the digital tools to do it, that's probably true. But they could still learn a lot from the older generation. Absolutely. And how they came about their skill set. Right. They and there's inherent there's inherent principles that technology will never change. Taking care of your customers, you know, taking care of your employees, doing, you know, the huge, last ten percent. You know, huge, yeah, right? Yeah. I think the younger generation has a fault of non communication skills. Yeah. Versus the older generation has that in spades, right? Um, but they have the skill set regarding how to maximize their efficiency, how to put systems in place how to grow a business a lot faster. I'm impressed by young trades these days that are talking to people about, you know, getting six figures of an investment into their business. And I'm like, you guys really have the nerve. You just, what's the worst they're going to say? No. Yeah. Right. Right. Like, that's not, that's not the norm from an older generation. They would never think that right. they would just build their business and bring in as many family members as possible and grow the business that way, marry into more people and then bring those people into the business. But they never thought, why don't I ask someone who has money to invest into me and my business and then grow the business that way. The younger generation is doing that. Mm -hmm. They're being smart about that. Right. Cause they see the value attached to it. But first they're growing their business. You have to make it attractive, right? So I'm very impressed by seeing these kids doing this. So tell me about your business as a GC. Like you, uh, you mentioned doing landscaping, hardscaping. I'm assuming you were building homes, doing kitchens, bathrooms, that kind of thing. What? So in the 2010 era, when you met your old uh, acquaintance yeah. and you started working together, what did what did that look like? Like what were you doing and did you have a team yourself or was it just you as a GC? No, it was, it was just me and, and him. And then we would do a lot of the work ourselves. It always started with rentals. I have always joked and, and it's not a joke. It's the truth. Like we started uh, with a bathroom and a laundry room. Right. And then eventually became like a kitchen. It became like the master suite. Then it became the second floor. Then it became the whole first floor uh, garages, whatever. It just became every room until you get the opportunity where you meet a client 
they're going to build a house. Now they don't want to buy a house. They want to build a house, mm-hmm. right? They've been probably, they have an old house that they've been living in there for maybe a, a decade or something like that. It doesn't suit them or the family that's growing. So they want to knock it down. They like you personally, you know, wise. And all of a sudden they go, would you want to bid on this? And then all of a sudden you're given the opportunity to build a house. And I always thought, and I always used to say this to future clients. I go, I pretty much renovated every single room. Why can't I just build a whole house? That's not the truth. <laughs> You're going to make a world of mistakes. And I think that I would tell any young person I probably have already, if you get the opportunity to build a house, you've given that opportunity, like, you know, a client come along and all of a sudden you, you've been doing rentals, you've been doing remodelings, you've been doing additions, you know, you know, you've been, all those kinds of smaller projects. I would say to every single younger person, find an older mentor and just beg them to guide you during the process. Because that's what was missing from us. We made so many mistakes that cost us money. We didn't make money. We lost money. That was Mm. a fact. And from, you know, after that first experience, I spoke to many more GCs and I asked them, how was your first build experience? Because I lost money. And the same deciding factor, none of them had mentors. None of them had someone that they could call and go, "Um, I got a question. I'm in this situation. How do I handle it? They didn't have that. And the internet didn't have that for them. Like they couldn't get that answer, right? So they would just do it on their own because they're stubborn, because they're contractors, right? And myself included. And we just figured it out ourselves. Mm. But we lost financial opportunity that way, right? Then you learn on the second one. Then you learn on the third one. Then you have a viable business at that point. But this generation now, I think, is avoiding those mistakes. They're making other mistakes. Sure, yeah. So as a GC working with subs, what do you think of the pros and cons? Because this is a bit of a trend in the in the outdoor living, hardscape, landscape industry. Of people like, hey, the labor market is so tough. I'm going to start working with subs. Like I'm seeing, I literally, I was on a phone call today about a guy that's beginning to do this. So what what do you see as the pros and cons of like being a GC and having subs as opposed to being an owner, being an, an owner with your own team? Thousand percent valuable. I couldn't wait to hire subs. He wanted to wait to hire subs because it was that mindset of like we can do it and if it ends up taking longer it won't we'll take the hit right and i'm like well that's not the way we should look at it we should look at it like why don't we take a chance on somebody to do it and they give us a price but there was always that risk of will they do a good job and then we have to fix it if i pay you to do something and then i have to fix it then i necessarily didn't pay you to do do the job right right but that's that's you as a person trying to find personalities and get people that will you know they they stand behind their word that's construction so you're going to meet the people who don't deliver you're going to meet the people who do deliver but i think that the second thing i would tell anybody that's getting started is that you first find your mentor second you find your team you're going to go through a few subs before you find your ideal team right and even when you find your ideal subs they may start to drop the ball they'll be great on the first job great on the second job okay on the third job really mess up on the fourth job then you're gonna have to have a conversation with them because they get kind of complacent at that point but that's construction so i think that subs are extremely valuable i started you know inquiring with other people through social media other gcs that i was watching them build and i was like how are you handling are you labor force you sub based like how is it all working most were subs You know, they were saying that it makes more sense for my business to grow as subs because now I can just give a bunch of work to a bunch of people. I could also do sub tiers where I can have different jobs and I can get this one done really fast. If I use this person or if I can get this one done a little longer, I can use this person, but I could possibly save money on this one, maybe lose a little bit of money on that one. So they got an idea to kind of navigate uh, clients, right? Did you ever see anybody that went from subs to labor force back to subs or vice versa? Yeah, they do that a lot. They're kind of floating back and forth because, I mean, up here in Canada, like the tax, it's the whole thing. It's like the moment a sub is working for you so many times, so many hours or whatever, they automatically become a uh, laborer for you, uh, an employee, sort of technically speaking, tax-wise. So a lot of guys were doing the sub things for tax purposes, but Mm -hmm. eventually you end up start paying them as an employee, Mm -hmm. right? Um, I think people just ride out the storm. They just try to figure out. I think that the bad part is where you'll get people that just assume you'll hire them automatically because you've done good work for them so then they're always going to come to you and i quickly learned that um i would give the benefit of doubt 
I was like, okay, you did a great job for me the first time. It's wonderful. So I just give you the second one. Then they would be pricing too high. And then I wouldn't get a job, right? Or I'd have to drop my numbers to get the job. But then you start calculating, like, you know this because you've gone through for your whole system is that I'm dropping my numbers to get the job. My team is making money. I'm not making yeah, money. Yeah. So it's like, what's the point of me not making money? I'm not a spectator here. I'm not just hanging out here. I'm contributing. I'm being a part of this process, but I need to run a business. I need to make money as well. So there's hard lessons that you learn. And I, I always revert back to the mentor that if you have someone that's older, that's been through this before, they will openly share with you what to avoid. Right. Yeah. So I think yeah. it's valuable to find that person. So what in, so I'm sure you've worked with hundreds of contractors yeah. and especially through the whole construction life podcast, like you've, you 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 have a zoomed out perspective. Yeah. What makes a good contractor? Number one, communication. Don't BS. Don't tell the other person what you think they want to hear. Mm -hmm. Tell the other person the truth. Mm -hmm. You're going to be late. You're going to be late. Exactly what time you're going to be late. Right. If you can't start that job, tell them you can't start that job. Don't tell them I'm going to be there on Monday and show up on Wednesday. Mm -hmm. Like communication. Mm -hmm. Answer the phone. If you're like, even these days, there are certain people that I've been on the show that I've worked with. They're answering the phone when I text them or I call them and they're on a vacation spot somewhere. And I'm like, so the excuse of not answering the phone, it doesn't, it doesn't work for me. Right. The only way that you don't answer the phone is because machinery or sounds on the job site at that moment. Right. But if you're as a trade, you're, you're, you can hear the phone or feel the phone at any given point of the day. If you don't respond back to a text or something, and I know that you're in town and you're working, and everything's fine, then that means you're ignoring me, which means that you're avoiding communication with me. So if you do that, eventually that other person's not going to want to work with you at all. Yeah. Because they're going to want to work with someone who's going to want to communicate with you. So I, I hear it from young and old. Like the old wants to like, just tell me the truth. Just tell me the simple truth. I don't care if it hurts. I don't care if the band aid's going to sting coming off. Just tell me the truth. I've had employees work with me. I've had subs make mistakes and I would get on job sites and all of a sudden they're reluctant to even come across me and look at me. And they're like, they're just like, you see them and they're not the person that you know who they are. Like, What's up? What's up? Yeah. What's going on? Uh, and then they're just dancing around. I go just, okay, what is the issue? Tell me the issue. Okay. We're in construction. What do we do first? Problem solved. Let's solve the problem. Yeah. What do we do? That's it. Yeah. And then they're surprised that you're not angry. And I'm like, I'm too old to get angry. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm way too, I don't even yell anymore. Like I don't have an understanding of that yelling part of it anymore. So it's like, why don't we solve the problem? That's yeah. the core of what contractors do. Yeah. We solve problems. And really business is, to your point, business as a whole, it, is, it stems on communication. Yeah. You know, it's like, because you hear the same thing talking with, or between homeowners and contractors as opposed to GCs and contractors is like, what's the number one thing you hear a homeowner say? They never called me back or they never gave me a quote, you know, and that's once you get the job, yeah. they disappear or, or yeah, I'm sure you've called contractors where you, they don't answer and uh, you can't even leave a voicemail. The voicemail box is full. Like, what does that tell you? <laughs> I'm waiting for an app to come out where it's like, you know how some cars have cameras everywhere. And I'm always fascinated that, they have these angles that you can see the car like in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. Like, I don't understand how there's an, there's no camera above <laughs> me. I don't understand how it is, but I want someone to design an app for a smartphone where I'm able to see the person that's grabbing the phone, looking at me calling them when I'm calling them and ignoring and putting it back into their pocket. <laughs> Cause then I can send them that video from that app where like, dude, just answer the phone. <laughs> I see you not answering the phone. You're ignoring me. All right. That's, I think that's the biggest problem in construction, young or old. I think that's the biggest problem. Yeah. Communication is huge. Yeah. I, I appreciate that. And that's cause that's a, that's I, to me, it's, it, it's, it's an inherent uh, problem, but it's also a bit of an original. Um, I think our listeners are going to appreciate that reminder. Uh, cause it is key. Like if you can't communicate with your team, with your customers, um, with your contractors, like it's the whole it's where, gambit. It's where problems, yeah. it's where problems begin. I mean, uh, bad news is bad news. Yeah. Turn it into good news. Yeah. So in your, in your time as a, as a contractor, what was the most difficult challenge that you faced and overcame? Um, I would say like just finally 
letting go, I guess, of uh, resistance. You know what I mean? Whether it was resistance with um, where you didn't understand why a sub or an employee wouldn't achieve the scope that you wanted, like what you were told that you, they would deliver, and you you were you you're dumbfounded that it wasn't done the way you were expecting it to be done because it was discussed, right? The same thing with the clients as well, where it's, they they tell you clearly that this is what you want, you deliver it, and then they change their mind as every client does. Right. And then you start having some resistance with them because now you want to be compensated fairly for the work that has been achieved. But they feel that since they, they didn't get what they wanted exactly, but it's been delivered that way. They feel that you should just change it on your own dime. So then you keep on taking these hits as a GC. And now you're taking hits from clients, you're taking hits from the sub trades, you're taking hits from suppliers or what have you. You're constantly taking these hits and you're like, why am I always being the one asked to take the high road? And I'm the one that's losing financial profit here, right? Why am I always doing that? And it bottles up in you and then you start getting upset about it. And then one little thing could trigger you at that point. And you're like going, let it go, man. Just let it go. And this is something I have learned from older mentors that I respect, where it's just like, just let it go, man. Yeah, and, and it makes me think of contractors that I know that have been in it for a long time. Instead of, instead of allowing a situation to trigger you in that moment, it's like, okay, we missed an expectation here. Let me get better at setting expectations. Yep. And if I can get better at setting expectations, I can avoid the problem entirely. Yep. You know, I know a landscaper that would tell, uh, or a, a water feature builder that would tell his clients that, dude, I am going to destroy your yard. It's going to be, it looked like a bomb went off in here. <laughs> and are you okay with that? You know, because you know how it is. It's like all, all they think is the beautiful picture that's yeah. on the, you know, and they're like, wow, I had no idea this was going to happen. Are you going to fix it? You know, all, you know, it's like setting those expectations, naming the problem before the problem even happens, naming the bad, yeah, yeah, naming naming the things, you know the things that could potentially cause them to be upset or just yeah. get uptight or there's that resistance. Yeah. And so just get it out of the way ahead of time. But then you also learn by doing so many more projects and you're dealing with clients, it becomes um, an ingredient for the final payment. Yes. And so it's it's like whether they do it willingly which you quickly learn that they do it on purpose because you get a lot of clients that you, they'll just say just ridiculously stupid things where, you know, we're a husband and wife team, but we never communicate. <laughs> I've actually had clients say that to me. Like we're a husband and wife, but we don't communicate. I go, so you don't want to communicate about the six figures that you're spending. And so you want on that a project. to be my fault? That's that nothing yeah. to do with me. Yeah. The reason why there's no wedding ring on my finger, I'm not in your marriage, but you guys need to communicate, right? So you can't, one person a come in and suggest something then person b come in and then change that and it was always frustration about you can't build two projects on the same property right you need to communicate and decide on where we're going to go down this path and then you can't use this as an ingredient for later on to say you remember that time where we asked for this but we didn't really want that and then you asked us to pay for that extra because it was a change well we don't want to pay for that now Welcome to construction, right? <laughs> so it's like you quickly learn, don't ever let yourself get to that end mark where they've got a bunch of ingredients that are going to add towards a yeah, discount. Trust those in real time. Yes. Get those out of the way. Because yes. if you wait for the final invoice, yes. it, it, they will come up. They, it's going to come up yeah. 100%. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And it's just like, they and you're the quarterback. You're the GC. So all the other trades have come and gone. They've done their work. They maybe have slightly disagreed with the final numbers on what's going to get done or what not's going to get done. But the truth is that um, you're the one that's going to be left holding the bag at the end. And that bag is going to be a lot lesser because the clients are going to point at you, not at your trades point at you. You're the point guy. Yeah. Then you kind of have to have conversations with your team and go back. Listen, I took a huge hit. I lost X amount on the next job. And then you have these conversations and it's like, listen, either we're a team or we're not a team. Yeah. Right. But the thing is that I, I learned a lot as being the GC. I was always the nice guy taking the well, high as road. As a GC, you are the chief communicator when you think about it. Like, you, know, you have to set the tone. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So if you're not communicating right with the client or communicating right with the trades and everybody that's on the, on the, on the site, it's your fault. Yeah. And you have to take that a bit, that accountability. Right. So what in, in your, in your time, uh, fr you've mentioned mentors a couple times now, what's the best advice you've ever been given? And maybe you kind of already kind of alluded to some of that, but what is 
the your kind of re- knee jerk reaction don't to that question. Don't ever take it personal. Don't ever take it personal. It's always business. It is just always, always going to be business. As much as the clients, and we've all seen this, you know this, is like they'll buy you dinners. They're like, come over, sit down, have breakfast with us, go for a walk. Like it's always just nice seeing sunshine and rainbows right at the very beginning. Then that quickly changed. Neighbors are the same way as well. Then things just start changing, and all of a sudden they start jabbing at you, and you're it's human. You'll take it personally. You totally will. Don't ever take it personally. Just treat it as a business transaction. Don't be cold about it. Don't be harsh about it. But don't take it personal. And the problem is that you like I think we talked on the other show, um, like taking it home. Mm-hmm. Like it's just gonna affect you uh, taking it home. Yeah, I get a lot of guys and and girls reaching out to me from the show. I mean, it's it's great that they think that I know a lot because I've spoken to so many people. Um, but I can only share what I've experienced from speaking to them and yeah. what I've experienced on being on a site, right? And um, they just they keep on asking me because they get into pickles, and they're like, "How would you address this? How would you do this?" Right? And obviously, legal comes up, liens come up, like just that whole resistance part, and you know back up against a wall and I'm going to show them and the clients are going to show you. And, and I just look at them like, how many years of your life do you want to wipe from your life? How many years do you want to take away from spending time with your children or you seeing them make another? How much money do you want to drain from your bank account or a line of credit? Like I just start asking them that. Like you need to really visualize that strongly because that's going to be your life for the next six, seven, ten years. Uh, there's one person who recently reached out to me, and he was like, "Finally going to court," and I'm like, "You got to." And that's what I learned from the mentor. I like, yeah, I get it. You take the high road, and you know, unfortunately, some mentors I've spoken to, they've lost millions of dollars over the course of their forty, fifty plus year career, right? It's, by not taking it personal, you but, mean? It, well, it's not so much, yeah, but by not taking it personal, making it a business transaction, but wanting to get the funds that they feel is deserved, yeah. right? Yeah. Because they did the work. They delivered yeah. everything. Yeah. And the unfortunate thing is the client had the ingredients at the end there and they didn't want to pay the final bill. So then what you think starts off as a six-figure final bill and then you start getting litigation going on and all of a sudden you start adding those six figures from the litigators, right? And it starts growing. It starts growing. So then that's why I said... How much of your life do you want to erase? Because that's what's going to happen. And so I, I've told everybody that's reached out to me and asked me, should I move forward with this? And I asked them those questions. And I just say, listen, don't take it personally. It's a hit. You learn from it. Take it to the next job now. And make sure you don't get into that situation. Setting expectations. That's it. I yeah. told all the younger generation, you guys are going to make your mistakes. All I can do is hopefully educate you never to get into these mistakes. What's a story where you've taken it personal in your experience? Um, I remember a client saying, like, coming onto the job site, and she was angry. And she said a statement that really upset me, extremely upset me, right? And, and I walked off the job site. I didn't want to be around her, him, the family, the site. I was really furious by this, right? And I shouldn't have done that. And what she said is, I refuse to take any uh, opinion from people who clean floors. Blue collar. So it was a hit. It was a, it was a jab. Yeah, it, it yeah. was a jab, right? It was a personal insult. Because it was an insult. She, she was an IT person who commanded over a personnel group of over 20 plus men. All uh, men. White collar over blue collar. Exactly. Yeah. And so for her to come in and basically jab at that, and, and she, she made sure that the crew heard that statement, right? And I didn't like that statement. I really hated that statement, right? And I took it personally, right? And I walked off the job site. The, the guys that were working there, they continued doing the work. And then some of them texted me and communicated with me later on. And by the time I calmed down, I basically, what my assessment of that was, she could say whatever she wants. Any client can say whatever they want, right? It doesn't matter. But in the end, she will never be able to build a house ever. She doesn't have the bandwidth. She doesn't have the experience. She doesn't have the interest. She doesn't have the skill set. She will never be able to build a house. And I told that to every single tradesperson that called me to ask me, are you okay, Manny? And I said, she will never be able to build a house. You I can talk to you, the painter, you, the tile setter, you, the framer, you, every tradesperson out there. 
all of you could build a house. All of you have the skill set to build a house. You may not have built a house yet, but all of you can build a house. She can't. And that's what I should have said to her when she said that, right? Because it was wrong of her to say that, but it was wrong of me to walk off the job site because of that, right? But that's what I learned from that lesson. So I tell a younger generation, just pay attention to that. Like that she may have better skills in other industries or other ideas or whatever it is, right? She may be making more money than you or whatever it is, but she can never do what you do, Mm -hmm. right? And despite, and if you really want to um, put yourself to her level where she thinks all you do is clean floors, I proudly clean floors. Yeah, well, that's what I was going to get to. That's what my mind was going to is like people, like contractors are proud of the work that they do. Like they take pride in it. It's a craft. It's an art. And it, it's, um, it is to your point, like, that person will never be able to put their own roof over their own head, you know? And so it goes back to, we all have in, in this world, we all have roles and it's not like one role is better than the other. We all need each other. And uh, yeah, appreciate that story. Uh, So let me just add one little thing to it. It's just um, what I really liked about what this show has become to that point of her saying that all we do is clean floors, right? is uh, I've met so many tradespeople in here, and part of the reason why I ask these certain questions at the end of my show, I've met tradespeople that they're artists and craftspeople in their own right. But when I ask them about what else you would be doing in your life, what other option is there out there? I've met people telling me, write a book, create a sitcom, be a musician, and they have these skill sets. They're, they actually have these skill sets to do these if they want to do these these other things that are not necessarily construction related. And it just teaches me that there's so much more to that person who's swinging a hammer than just swinging the hammer. Mm-hmm. They have other interests. Like I, I, there was so many people that just came up and they, and I get so excited about hearing from that. Like I've had people tell me that they want to run a ranch. Like they want to operate a ranch, right? Like they want to just be outdoors and do that stuff. Like there's so many people that have come up with things that are not necessarily construction relevant. And I'm like fascinated by that. So for a person like her to say what she said, she really doesn't know who we are. Yeah. You may think we're the janitor in breakfast club. You know what I mean? Where he just, he basically just said, listen, I have keys to every single one of these lockers. I know exactly all your secrets. I know everything, but you think he's just some guy in blue collar uniform walking around just cleaning floors right and i'm like trades people have so much more going for them than they really know so much more sorry i just so, no i love that so how did you did you do a pod, the podcast the construction life podcast since the beginning of your of your no. okay so how did you get into that the podcast yeah it was uh so when i finally was able to let go of being a gc and hiring subs and then supervising and just being that GC that comes on the site and hangs out, brings coffee, talks, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, you'd have younger generation, even older ones, because I always love speaking to the older ones, right? It doesn't matter if they had broken English. I, you could still communicate, right? Mm-hmm. Construction is its own language, right? So you can communicate. Um, they would ask questions. They would start talking to me. So we would start talking construction. Then all of a sudden, half hour, hour later, should have recorded it. <laughs> should have recorded this conversation this was a beautiful conversation this is amazing this conversation could have educated somebody else shared yeah, somebody yeah that's where the show came from i just like there's so many conversations happening that should have been recorded to share and then i said let's start recording these shows and then all i did was like hey, you get the tactical clear i didn't yeah. know anything about this i didn't know anything about mics i didn't know anything about yeah. any of this stuff right and then you just you literally walk into a shop and you're like I need to start a podcast and then they give you the grocery list of things that you're, you mm-hmm. need and then you put it together and then you test the system with laptops and all this other stuff and then you start recording these conversations. What's one of the most memorable uh, conversations you've had on the podcast? Um, I wouldn't say it's like most memorable. It's, kind of, it's almost like the same kind of question where people have asked me because they've seen the table here in the studio. There is no such thing as a favorite movie, right? Yeah. You can't, like it's, if you're a builder, I'm pretty sure there's no such thing as a favorite build. Like there's, there's lots of, lots of, projects that I've worked on that I'm fascinated by certain details about it. So when it comes to conversations, there's like, 
it depends on what it is. I'm always surprised by certain things. Even when talking to you and you brought up your trip to uh, South America mm. there, I was like fascinated by that. <laughs> no, it's just like little things. I think most recently I could probably contribute to, uh, we did a show recently um, with a writer, a Portuguese writer, and he wrote a book called The Portuguese Immigrant about his grandfather. And when he was talking about it, I connected with it 100% because they're very similar to my family, right? So there was a lot of moments in his storytelling of what he was talking about, how it got started, the travel for him to get the story, to find all this information about his grandfather that he didn't really know about, and then the heritage back home from where his family trees from, right? And I was like, I know exactly what you're talking about. I was connecting with a lot of the things that he was sharing. Complete stranger that I just spoke to maybe a half a dozen times on emails, to maybe a half a dozen times on DMs on IG, and then walks in here medium for the very first time physically, and then sitting down and talking for 90 minutes. I think we almost spent two hours on that show, and I connected with everything he was saying, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So it's like, I think there's a lot, that's the good thing about the show is that there's a lot of connections going on. Yeah, there's a lot of things we have in common. And, yeah. and, and there's there's a there's a level of, I don't know, encouragement or 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 um, just yeah, encouragement. It's, it's refreshing to, to have yeah. those experiments, experiences and those exchanges with people that know you. Yeah. They, they, they get you. They yeah. get your challenges. They get your, your joys and your, their pro the, what you're proud of and all those things. Yeah, so that's, sure. that's fun. Um, in your, in your uh, time as a contractor, um, if you could go back to the day that you started, what would you do differently? It was just a mentor thing. The mentor thing. Yeah. Yeah. I would, uh, the same amount of effort and time I was spending trying to get more construction knowledge by going to the trade shows and stuff, I should have been looking up established builders, possibly ones that are close to retiring or some ones that, you know, some businesses that have been around 10 plus, 20 plus years, whatever, mm -hmm. knock on their door and go, listen, I'm a kid. I don't know anything about construction. Anybody here can give up, I don't know, a few hours a week. And I'll buy them lunch, dinner, coffees, whatever. I'll come and drop like whatever. And just can you spend two, three hours with me a week mm -hmm. and just tell me what to watch out for? Mm -hmm. um, just have I, these kinds of conversations. I would do that. Yeah. I would do that yeah. in a heartbeat. Yeah. And I wouldn't be afraid to do it either because I didn't do it when I was inquiring so about construction. What keeps people from going out there and what keeps people from going out there and getting mentors? Like what, what is it? Is it, is it's it a fear? It's a fear of them being laughed at and it's a fear of them thinking they're asking the wrong questions or even stupid questions. And I, I've said it on the show a thousand times. There's no such thing. So yeah. you shouldn't have that fear. Yeah. You shouldn't be afraid to approach someone that's already gone through what you're about to go through because it, they'll tell you. It's, it's like you hear stories. I, I don't really have a good example right now, but you hear stories of people that um, someone that you think would not have five minutes for you when they see say a younger person or whatever, that's like asking genuine questions from a heart of like, I'm trying to figure this out. Yeah. And I see, I view you as someone that has figured this out. What can I learn from you? Yeah. It's amazing that the human response to that is like, let me make time out of my day to help you. Like, it's like people, people, I believe want to help those that yep. are trying to get ahead, yep. you know? And so to your point, like we, we tend to fear rejection or like they're going to laugh me off or, or whatever. When in fact, when they see someone that's like, this kid's trying, this kid's trying to, to make get ahead, and like I, I have so many lessons I've learned that I can help him avoid him or her avoid. You know, I had a I early on in the show, like probably single digit shows. There was a GC that was on the show, and um, American met a Canadian, moved to Canada. Now he's moving back to America. Um, he was setting up a business here in Canada when he moved here and married her, he door knocked. He just door knocked on all these businesses. Nobody would give him the time of day until he finally found one. And it was, it was hundreds before he found one. That's and, perseverance. But he knew that he needed to get this one to have some sort of guidance, whether that was like fractionally just something simple. Yeah. Like he just needed it. I, I have yet to hear about, you know, there's been a lot of door knocking going on, but I don't think the younger generation, and I think they should totally do this. Um, we drive around the city all the time. We know what a job site looks like. We see the, the hoarding, we see the fencing, we see the signage, we see all that stuff. Show up on the job site with your PPE, find the GC and go, listen, can I hang out on this job site for a few weeks? I'll clean up. I'll clean up. I will organize everything. Will you allow me to do that? Can you please? I'm I'm so and so. 
Who are you? You're the GC. Okay. I've heard about you. I've heard about your business. I know about your business. Will you allow me to do that? I'm not expecting any money. I just want to be in this environment. I think you would go so far if you were to do that because that GC would be like, who's this kid? What's this kid all about? Yeah. It's like, uh, and they would start speaking to that kid going, yeah, right, right. It's the same thing that we were just saying. Like yeah. people want to help people that yeah. are trying to get ahead. They would start sharing. And uh, Greg Woodstock, the founder and CEO of Aquascape, the manufacturer of those water feature products, he, he, one of his lines is uh, the easiest way to be successful in life is to find someone that's doing what, that, that's, that's done what you're trying to do and yeah. do what they did. Yep. Yeah. And that's kind of the definition of a mentor. Yeah. You know, he'd be a great person on the podcast, by the way. Sure. If you want to connect yeah, me. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I'd love okay, to have yeah. that. Yeah. Um, so the last question I want to ask you, because like you, I talk, I interview a lot of, of our synced up customers on this podcast, uh, the cost of doing business show. And, um, I, I, what I go in there is just sh like trying to pull out experiences and perspectives from a person, but I don't very often talk to someone that's talked to hundreds or thousands yeah. of other contractors. So, I'm curious, what do you see, uh, what do you see as common traits across contractors? And what I'm looking for is things that these are mistakes that seemingly every contractor tends to make, or these are, these are, um, things that every contractor eventually has to figure out to stay in business. What are those common traits that you see? Cause I'm hoping that someone listening could be like, huh, yes, I haven't lived through that experience yeah. yet. And I can accelerate my own. Yeah. Uh, it's. Weston, it's, it's, it's one. There's one mistake. Okay. <laughs> I'm just like, they all make it. I did it. Everybody makes the same mistake. You put too much time and effort on the skill and not enough time and effort on the paper. Yeah. Which is kind of back to what we were talking about on your show, you know, about my story with Synced Up. Yeah. They do it all the time. I did it all the time. I, I tell them all the time. I go, listen, if you're allocating 100 hours a week to build your skill set, to practice your skill set, you got to be doing 100 hours a week on the paper side of the business. If you're not doing that, then you're going to fail. 100% you're going to fail. If you, if you want to continue buying more tools, you're going to fail because the same amount of money you want to spend on buying tools, you, be, you should be sitting, uh, spending on putting systems in place. Because I've seen kids and they've set up businesses and they focused on systems. Unfortunately, a lot of the people that we interviewed, um, they got hurt. They got hurt and then they were shut down because they couldn't work. And then while they were recouping, they were thinking about how to rebuild their business and they were focusing on the paper side of the business. The systems. But it took that getting hurt, that injury, to let them to know. Force it. I have to focus on this now because physically I can't do what I'm really good at. But if you go into the business right now, I spend a thousand dollars a week on new tools. I'm going to spend a thousand dollars on a system. If I'm going to spend a hundred hours on uh, building my craft, I'm going to spend a hundred hours building a system. If you do that ratio, I rather you go more on the, on the systems mm -hmm. on the paper side. Mm -hmm. Me personally, I think even 10 or 20 points more, but if you go 50, 50, because right now, most tradespeople, most contractors, what is it? It's got to be 91, 92% <laughs> bit craft and then yeah. a trickle of whatever, you know, whatever comes up. And to right? your point, I've heard many a contractor that's been at it for 20 plus years say the same thing. I focus too much on the skill set, the skills, the skill sets are, listen, I haven't built anything in a little while. Like it's because I've been focusing on this show, but I'm itching to like, it's like riding a bicycle. You know, this as well too. Like it was weird. I went from, I was always riding bicycles when I was younger in my teenage years. By the moment I got a motorcycle, bicycles disappeared because they weren't going as fast for me. Right. But I got back on a bicycle to ride again. It was easy. I just got right back into it. it was, I, there was nothing to pick up. Right. So the skill set, you can stop for years, not swinging the hammer. And I guarantee you, you'll be able to do it again yeah. in a heartbeat. Yeah. Right. But the paper, the systems, you need to teach yourself how to love that. If you can't teach yourself how to love it, then you're going to fail. I don't care who you are. You're going to fail. You're going to have an okay business as a skill set based business. You're going to own a job. It's a job. You're going to own a job. And, and, we, and I've always said that this is a career. I don't care who you are. I don't care what trade you are. It's a career. Yeah. It's not a fallback. It's not a job. You want to make it a fallback. You want to make it a job. You can do that. That's a choice but you can make it a career. Yeah, 100%. And then you can build a business big enough that someone else is going to be interested in one day. 
Yeah, and if, if if there's a lot of people out there that pour decades of their life into their yep. business, but really when they get to the end of it, they weren't paying themselves enough. They weren't putting anything away for retirement. They think they're going to sell their business, and when they go to sell their business, all they, what they realize is what they have to sell is their trucks, their assets, and that's it. That's the value of their business that they built. Yeah, when it could be so much higher, right? so much more. Yeah, and it's going back to the line that I repeated on your show. Um, Systems and processes are the keys out of the entrepreneurial prison. Yeah. Otherwise, the business owns you, and and it's it's uh, there's a lot of contractors that by choice. I like how you framed that by choice. Yeah. Never graduate above that, and it's a it's a, it can be an okay choice. It just depends what your goals Every are. Every day you're choosing yeah. that. Like yeah. I mean, like I I always I I always had a problem with anybody who never said hello in the morning on a job site. It takes no effort to say hello. Yeah. yeah. Just I don't general, care what language it is. Courtesies. I would actually encourage anybody if they wanted to share it in a different language, right? I th- because then I'd be able to learn something, right? And and you could even add, you know add the profanity attached to that language <laughs> as well, right? Because you had some really grumpy people. But I never understood why they never said hello. Like it's just the start of the day. The sun is still rising. We finally got parking spots. Everything's all good. Let's get this day rocking and rolling, right? Let's start with a hello. You know what I mean? And so I would get frustrated. I would get a little frustrated by the ones that didn't say hello. And so you always said hello. Just takes no effort. Say hello. So you have a choice to whether or not you want to say hello. Yeah. You have a choice whether or not to grow the business into a, a career. You have a choice to to grow this entity of yours that um, could be bought out by somebody yeah. one day. But it won't it won't be bought out unless you can show that it's a strong business out right. there. It's a business even if you're not there. Yes. And uh, in in that frame, what's cool is if you're building that system and building that business that can run even if you're not there, even if you're still there, you're, I mean, it, it gives you the freedom and the margin to pursue those other things in life or, or that your family can view your business as a blessing, a source of the blessings of life instead of the the curse and the competition of of your time, you know. Every contractor wants to do something else outside of construction at some point in their life, right? Everyone is waiting to do something else. They want to put their time in. They want to build a brand. They want to build something that is a legacy for them, right? That they can be proud of, that can be handed off to somebody else or sold to somebody else. But they all in their back of their head are thinking about other things they want to do. We are creative individuals. We build things with our hands. We build things with our minds. So you can't tell me that every single tradesperson out there, whether it's like you're doing drains to doing the roofing or whatever, there's something else that you want to build that's not necessarily directly involved in construction. Kind of back to your question on your show, like what else would you do if you yeah. were? Yeah, that's, that's cool. why I'm that. impressed by the musicians, the artists, yeah. the writers, um, like just anybody that has different crafts that are not construction related, right? And why not make it construction related if you want to make it? Like I've had people on this here, I want to write a children's book that's centered around construction. I go, do it, man. That's awesome. Do it because <laughs> there aren't enough of those out there. Yeah. Right? So it's like you, you look at your own kids. you got all these kids growing up in these construction families. And I'm like, start bringing these opportunities to them. Start showing these other ideas. But you have to do it. So you have to focus on your business. So why not send, spend the time and money on building a system and then building your brand. And then you're not there anymore because it's running well. You're organizing it. You're, you're supervising it at that point. And guess what? You got free time. You can go golfing. You can go hang out and chill out. You can go on more vacations or you can also build something else. Yeah. Yeah. Why not? That's right. I love that. So well, Manny. Thanks for having me. No, oh, thank you, man. Show. Yeah. And thanks oh. for letting us use your yeah, no, studio. Totally. This is awesome. Totally, man. I appreciate and it. Here, I want to give, I give one of these to all the people that I have on the show. What's that? So my uncle. Thanks, man. My uncle is a, was a taxidermist for 30 years. Then he <laughs> turned potter. And so he makes these handcrafted uh, it, mugs that uh, we get made with our own logo on them. And I give them out. That's sharp, man. Thank you so much. <laughs> That's really sharp, man. You're going to see me drinking from this on the show. <laughs> awesome. So I got to go left-handed. Though, yeah, so, right. Exactly. So the cameras can see it, right? <laughs> I should have got one with your own logo. No, on no, it. no, no. This is great. No, I'd rather have this one, man. This is great. Thank you very much. I can give you an espresso cup. I've got yeah. an like espresso cup. Uh, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, man. That's amazing. Yeah, this was awesome. I'm glad this is so, uh, it's so crazy how, you know, connections are made. Like we Yeah, met, we just met at that event there. Yeah. 
there and I, I, it was a last minute thing for me to pass by yeah. and uh, I was just saying hello and then I was like great then we got talking and we all of a sudden like, we let's just do connected, this right? yeah. yeah so yeah. it was amazing uh, that's what I love about you know business is is these kinds of encounters and connections with people yeah. and gives it gives it meaning you have you know you have it's uh, those relationships that that give I don't know it's like that it's like your bank account of relationships yeah. and with you know that's what's <laughs> filling up so that's yeah, awesome yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I, that's what I love about it. That's what I love about the show. And social media is the same way. Uh, like, same with the kids. Don't be afraid to reach out and DM. Like, what's the worst thing they're going to do? Ignore you? Yeah, Second right. worst thing they're going to say is, no, I'm not interested in talking to you. Right. So what? Then move on to the next yeah, person. Yeah. I've replied to every single person that has been respectful to me. Right. If you want to criticize me and call me names, I'm not going to respond to it. I don't care about that. <laughs> right. But I mean, anybody that's got a question and like, even just this week alone, it was like three people reached out. I got to pick your brain, Manny. I got to pick your brain. It's yeah. like, okay, great. Let's set up a time and I'll talk to you and let's, sure. let's just talk. And then we can, and that's super generous. I love it, how you're giving if it's back. helping you, you know, it's nice. It's great. So speaking of that, where can people find you and pick your brain and, and continue the, the, the conversations we've been having here? My phone number is in all the show notes. Okay. We're, we're on all the podcast channels. We're on YouTube. We're on rumble. Uh, I'm on IG. You can find me at TCL underscore the construction life. You can find me on Twitter or X. Uh, I still call it Twitter. Yeah. Um, but no, you look up the construction life, you'll find me everywhere. And then uh, any of the shows that we've done, my 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 phone, my mobile is there. Okay. Right. So by all means, I encourage anybody to text me. Just tell me who you are name wise, because, and, you know, I get a lot of spam and stuff because I give out my number um, and I'll make time. I may not be able to answer right away, especially if I'm recording right now. Sometimes you probably see me on the show and my phone lights up there and I just see it in the corner of my eye, but I'm not going to answer it because I'm having a conversation with somebody. Um, but I'll get back to you. I totally will get back to you and, and respond to you. And then if you want to pick my brain, I'll share what I know and what I've experienced. That's it. Is it going to help you? I have no idea. Right. I Can I guide you down a path? I don't know. Maybe we don't know. Right. Construction is different today than it was when I got into it. Right. It's a little different today. Yeah. I think it's more challenging now. I think there's a lot of hurdles these days. Um, I think that the younger trades, the younger contractors, the younger GCs, um, they're dealing with a lot more than I had to deal with when I got started. Right. There's a lot. And I also think that there's a lot of um, people want to be celebrities. Mm. They all want to be rock stars of construction. And I think that um, you got to just uh, not tell yourself that you're a rock star of construction and not necessarily wait for someone to tell you that you're a rock star of construction. You just got to build the best you possibly can. It yeah. doesn't matter if it's a, a, a job that you don't really care about. I still think that you should give the best that you can. Yeah. Even when clients have annoyed me and there was frustration, I still went in, kept my head down, built I built it to the way that I said I was going to build it. And I built it that way. I always built it that way. So don't wait for that celebrity status thing. If you want to do that, then by all means do that. At that point, you're a celebrity and you're not a contractor anymore. Yeah. Make the call if you want to do that. By all means be that. There's a whole other category. You could be you can be celebrity. It's fine. I don't I don't care. But you can't be both. Yeah. You gotta be one or the other. Yeah. So uh, I think that's good advice. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, man. It's great Appreciate talking it, to you. Yeah. I like being interviewed. I should get interviewed more <laughs> this often. This is fun, right? Yeah, it's totally fun, right? <laughs> Normally, I'm asking all the questions. Awesome. Man. Well, go check out Manny and his show. Um, he's Thanks. been, yeah, f over 500 episodes of yeah, yeah. contractors and construction. And, like, you can just tell, like, we've been, sh the, the nuggets we've been <laughs> discussing are universal to, yeah. to the trades. So, yeah. appreciate you having me here. Thank you. Awesome. All right. Okay.